to cater your time. We're on the second of our Lives of the Saints series. We obviously did St. Francis last mm -hmm. month. Next month, we are doing Dorothy Day. Uh, <laughs> uh, Frank War and uh, Diana Condor will be coming on the 12th of December. Uh, same time, same, same place here, 945, to talk about Dorothy Day, who is a servant of God on her way to the canonization. Uh, the other thing I want to mention to you coming forward is next, the Adult Faith Formation Committee is very happy to announce that we are having our book discussion for winter spring. It will begin on the 17th of February, and the book is called Morning to Pray by James Martin. Uh, and it really, I read the book, and it says a guide for everyone, and that is indeed true. It's a very readable book. He has, it's very accessible. It covers a whole range of topics. We'll probably be having a Zoom conversation, uh, which will be announced as we get closer. And after the first of the year, it will be available at the book house in Cyrus Plaza for a discount. Uh, to give you one idea, just briefly, is uh, they have a section here is asking questions like, how do you know when you're praying it's really God? <laughs> <laughs> or could it be yourself or an evil spirit or whatever? He raises, a, he doesn't answer all the questions, but he raises a lot of interesting questions and gives an array of topics all around anything you could do with prayer. So I would encourage you to keep abreast of it. We'll be doing this again beginning in February of next year. So without any further delay, I turn it over to Jennifer to talk about this. Thank you, Jake. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was a little surprised when Dave asked me to talk about St. Patrick Tekulika, but uh, we had, he gave us, everybody who's doing the presentation, some discussion questions to aim our talk at. And we really enjoyed the Franciscan talk last month, which was very interesting. Uh, so one of the questions that Dave, can everybody hear me OK? If you don't mind, I've had my shots. I'll take my mask off, and then you can hear me better. Um, one of the, there's another couple, there's another chair in the front for folks that are just coming in. And we can always get more chairs if we need them. Um, One of the questions Dave asked all the speakers was, why is this saying important to you, and what does their charism, why do you find it attractive about their charism? And I grew up in North Greenbush, and I have been a history buff since I was a little girl. So uh, I was really thrilled when our local girl St. Kateri Tekawitha, well, she was Blessed Kateri then, was going to be canonized. And about 14, 12 to 14 years ago, I got very interested in the practice of iconography, writing or painting sacred icons. And Dahlia Herring and I, Dahlia sitting right here, went down to uh, Columbia County to study with a very good iconographer there, Christine Simonell Hales, who ended up doing our icons for the for the sanctuary when we redecorated it. Now, um, I've been studying icons for about um, five or six years, and it was announced that Saint Cattery was or Blessed Cattery was going to be canonized in 2012, and right away because of my history interest, I wanted to write an icon of St. Catherine. Now, you on the bulletin and upstairs in the sanctuary, you've seen Christine's icon of St. Catherine. An icon is a portrait of the saint in heaven, in the uncreated light of God in heaven. They usually have a gold background, but not always. And an iconographer is supposed to study the life of the saint. And what did they wear? And if it's a person who uh, was alive after photography, then you have an actual image to work with. So uh, St. Cattery, obviously being in the 17th century, she, there are not photos of her, but there is a portrait by a Jesuit who knew her. And uh, St. Cattery was born in the Mohawk Valley in a 
relatively little known period of history called the Beaver Wars. So we had two Indian groups living in New York State along the eastern edge of, uh, eastern edge of New York State in the Hudson Valley. We had the Algonquin Indians and from about uh, Schenectady all the way to Buffalo, we had the five nations of the Iroquois. And Iroquois is the French name for them. They, are, they call themselves the Haudenosaunee. I'm sorry, my, Mo, my Mohawk pronunciation is not great, and I can only pronounce something that I've seen it printed phonetically. So the Haudenosaunee were the five tribes of the Iroquois, and the easternmost tribe is the Mohawks. Now, as you know, in about 1609, the French come up and settle the St. Lawrence Valley, and the Dutch come up the Hudson River, and both countries are interested in trading for furs. So they build Fort Orange down by the river, and the Dutch are trading with the Mohicans for furs, and they pretty soon realize that they actually can uh, get a lot more furs dealing with the Iroquois. And so uh, they eventually stop backing up the Mohican tribe against the Mohawks, and they are trading with Mohawks. Now, we have a, a portrait here by professional, very successful portraitist Kevin Gordon, and he was commissioned by the uh, National Catholic Museum in Washington, D.C. to paint this portrait. And we have our icon of St. Cattery that Christine made. And in the back, on the table, I have one of my icons of St. Cattery. Most of the pictures of St. Cattery that you see are influenced by Hollywood. So mostly she's wearing buckskin, she's got a headband, she's got a feather. And that is not actually what the Mohawk people wore post contact with the Europeans. So uh, let's see here. Cattery was born, or uh, Degawifa, as I should say, was born in Orysville, out in the Mohawk Valley. Uh, then it was called Osernon, and it was a pretty big Mohawk village. And can we go to the next slide, please? So the Iroquois people lived in villages in long communal houses, long houses made of bark. And inside there would be several fire pits in the center. And each family group of the mother, four families would share a fire pit. And so uh, they also sometimes had palisades outside to protect the village. Could you go to the next slide, please? So here's an illustration of an Iroquois village. And you can see the palisade. You can see the longhouses. And I, I imagine that some of you have heard that old quotation from Tertullian, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Well. Uh, the Jesuits came to Canada, and they were being missionaries to the Algonquins up in Canada and out around the Great Lakes. And some of them were Father Isaac Jobes, St. Isaac Jobes, St. Jean de Brebeuf. Well, one, one uh, day in the 1740s, Isaac Jobes and some other missionaries were setting out for their Huron missions, and they were captured by the Iroquois, the Mohawks. And this is the period of the Beaver Wars, and so the French, the Dutch, and the Iroquois, and the Hurons, everyone is fighting for control of who is going to control the beaver trade. The Native Americans actually did not, at least in North America, did not develop metalworking technology. They did great stuff with what they had. They had clay cooking pots. They had stone tools. But they did not have metal. And so when the French and the Dutch came, all of a sudden, these Europeans are going to sell them metal tools and woolen cloth. 
and they were very happy to buy it. So St. Cattery is growing up in the town that is closest to the Dutch settlements. And so the folks there in Osernon or Orysville, pretty soon the mothers are not uh, tanning all this buckskin to sell clothes anymore, they're selling it out of woolen cloth and another trade item was linen shirts. You know, you could buy uh, in Fort Orange, you could buy a linen shirt for like three or four beaver skins, but up in Montreal you had to pay five or six beaver skins. Now, um, when St. Isaac Jokes and his companions were brought down to Osernan. Uh, they were very badly treated by the Mohawks there. Um, if you ever have seen the 1991 film Black Robe, which is a great Canadian film about the Jesuits in the New World, but it's pretty tough going. You've got to have an awful strong stomach to watch it. Um, it was a, a great depiction of the things that both groups faced in this cultural connection. And St. Isaac Jogues and his companion Rene Goupil were, were tortured. They were uh, treated as slaves in the Mohawk village. And Rene was killed in, I think, 1742 or three. Yeah, 1742. And Isaac Jogues escaped when he was down here at Fort Orange. The Iroquois had come down in the spring to fish when the salmon and the shad were running in the Hudson, and he <coughs> was able to hide. The Dutch at Fort Orange had actually tried to ransom him, but the Mohawks at Osternon were not going for it. And I distinctly remember at Kapakai when Father Shaw talked about how, in history class, how they removed St. Isaac jokes four fingers so that he would no longer be able to hold the host when he was saying mass because you remember in those days that only the priest could touch the host and he could only touch it with the four fingers. And so uh, St. Isaac jokes gets back to France. He has, uh, gets uh, permission from the Pope to say mass using his other fingers and he comes back to Canada as a diplomat and he's later killed along with another companion. And that all happened at Osternon, Orysville, so the blood of the martyrs being the seat of the church. About 10 years after that, uh, the Iroquois practiced a custom called mourning war, as in mourning your deceased loved ones. And they would bring captives from other places and have them replace deceased family members. So if you were captured by the Iroquois in previous centuries, you might be uh, treated as a slave, you might be adopted into the family, and if you were really, really unlucky and they thought you were very, very brave, you would be tortured. That's what happened to St. John de Grey Book. So uh, a, a young Algonquin Christian woman from Three Rivers in Canada was a captive who was brought to Osernon, and she married the chief of that group in, uh, can you go to an interior? Unfortunately, when we tested these slides on Thursday, we had a little trouble, and yesterday I put some more in hoping they'd work, and this morning, of course, when you're all set to do your talk, all of a sudden some of them won't work. So I'm sorry about that, but we'll, we'll live with it. There we go, thank you. So the Iroquois are living in a matrilinear society, and the clan mothers of the tribe are the people in charge. They pick the chiefs. There's a big council of chiefs, but anything they decide, the clan mothers have to approve of. The clan mothers pick the chiefs, and the they, Iroquois are not really into property, but the longhouse would be the family groups of the mother. So you would have the grandmother, the daughters, 
the granddaughters, and they would marry somebody from outside their clan who the man would come and live with the mother's family, and he would provide the meat through hunting and defense through war. And the Iroquois women cultivated the fields, the three sisters, the corn, the bean, and the squash, their primary diet. And you can see in this picture corn cobs that have been harvested and braided, the, the uh, husk braided together to store them for the winter. <coughs> there are pumpkins over there in the right hand side, the squash, and they would have baskets full of the beans that they had harvested. And they are the ones that are, are keeping things going in the village while the men are out hunting for the summer or making war or observing their enemies or bringing back captives. So the, uh, this is where Degawitha grew up. Now, unfortunately, along with metal tools and woolen cloth, the Europeans also brought smallpox, measles, and liquor. The Native Americans in North, uh, in South, North and South America had no resistance to these communicable diseases. So when Degawitha was about four, Asunan had a very bad outbreak of smallpox, and her mother, her father, and her baby brother all died, and as many as 60% uh, of the village died of smallpox. And so she was taken in by her father's relative, apparently her uncle. I would think it would be the father's sisters, but the Europeans didn't have a really good grasp of, of uh, matriarchal society. So the books always talk about her uncle, her uncle, her uncle, and her aunts, but it might have been her aunts that adopted her. And unfortunately, she was left, after a very bad case of smallpox, with very bad scars, pockmarks all over her body, and it affected her eyes. And that was why she was called Tekawitha, which is she who feels her way, or she that bumps into things. <laughs> and you will see in portraits of her that she has her blanket pulled over her head to protect her eyes from the sun. No sunglasses in the 17th century. The uh, sunlight really bothered her damaged eyes, and so she would work inside, or when she was outside, she would have her blanket pulled over her head. And now, uh, let's see here. Um, in 1666, the French actually hauled some artillery pieces all the way down to the Mohawk Valley and forced the Iroquois to make a peace treaty with them. And one of the provisions of the treaty is that Jesuit missionaries will be able to come to the Iroquois villages. And so uh, after that, it was common for Iroquois villages to move from spot to spot to fret for fresh farmland. And can we try to have uh, number three find it? That, that one, Fonda, Shrine at Fonda. Thank you. So the Osternon village was abandoned and the people moved across the river to Conewaga, which today is known as Fonda, New York. And in the 1930s, the Franciscans put a lovely shrine there and started developing a shrine for St. Cattery. And if you could go to the um, field, be Fonda. Okay, thank you. Father Thomas Grassman did early archaeology on the top of the hill and found the Kanawaka village. And in the 1950s, uh, they got volunteer archaeologists in and they excavated where the village was. And it's supposed to be the most excavated, completely excavated Mohawk village in the valley. And so there were about um, 12 longhouses in this village. And this is where Cattery lived for most of her life. And she would help in the fields. 
she would help sew clothes, she would do beading. Before that, you'll, uh, if you remember in the Gordon portrait, the embroidered blanket, that was done with porcupine quills probably, but that was what they used before they had European glass beads or porcupine quill embroidery. And Cattery is very good at this close hand work. And so she helped her, her family, her aunts and her uncle, and they got a Jesuit missionary. And can you go to the spring, Fonda, please? Okay, yes. Thank you. On the top of the hill in this photo is the village, was the village of Kahnawaga, and down the side of the hill there's a spring. And St. Cattery and the other girls would go there for water and bring it back up to the longhouses. And when I was working on my icons in the summer of 2013, I went out to Orisville and Fonda, and it happened to be Ascension Thursday, and I went to Mass at the Shrine, and I was thrilled to see the beautiful flowers in the woods behind the Kahnawaga Village site. And so that is very close to the spring where St. Cattery got water from. Now, uh, let's see. Can you go to um, the Lynn Tantillo picture? Let's try. Winter, winter in the back one. There we go. Thank you. Okay. So local artist Lynn Tantillo, you know, who does history paintings, he did this great picture of Hunters returning to the longhouse with some wild turkeys on their backs, bringing home food in the winter time, and there's the Mohawk River in the distance. So, Cattery grows up here, and when she was about 18, they got a Jesuit missionary, and she had been taught to pray by her mother, and she was thrilled to have a missionary come to Kahnawaga. And her uncle let her attend instruction, and she would go to the chapel to mass, and eventually uh, she got baptized when she was about 17 or 18. Now, after she was baptized, her, her uncle was very um, anti-Christian, anti-Catholic. For one thing, it was, it was encouraging people to go to Canada and they were losing more people in their villages. And of course, he wanted to stick to the traditional ways. And so he was not really thrilled when St. Cattery became a Catholic. When she became a Catholic, she started keeping holy the Sabbath. She wouldn't uh, work in the fields on Sunday. She would go to Mass. And she would pray. She would make little oratories for herself in the woods and, and construct a cross tied together with branches or carved one in a tree. That's why in our icons she's shown holding a wooden cross. And so the um, unfortunate drunks in the village and, and children and people would jeer at her and throw stones at her and try and discourage her from going to Mass. And her aunts were very unhappy that she is now not working in the cornfields on Sunday. And so on Sunday, she was not allowed to have any food. Oh, dear. Because she was so harassed, somehow word gets back up to the other Kahnawaka, the mission on the St. Lawrence River across from Montreal. And there are a number of Iroquois Catholics who are living there, Oneidas, Mohawks, different tribes. And a uh, adopted relative of St. Cattery's encourages um, a Oneida, who's a great warrior and become a Catholic. His name was Hot Ashes or Hot Powder. He and one of Cattery's adopted sister, Anastasia's relatives, they go down to the Mohawk River and they want to bring her back up to the mission at Kahnawaga, St. Francis Xavier Mission in Canada. Um, fortunately, when they get there to the Mohawk Valley, 
Cattery's uncle is down in Schenectady trading with the Dutch because he would not have let her leave. And can you try and find the canoe picture, please? I know it's near the end. There we go. So Cattery leaves with them and they start back up going to uh, Montreal and her uncle finds out, rushes back from Schenectady and starts to chase them and on, he never finds Cattery. He finds them, she's hiding in the woods, the uncle's finds out that, oh no, we haven't seen her. And so he goes back to the Mohawk Valley and there, take the water route, the most easiest, the most easy way to get around in the 17th and 18th century. They canoe up the Hudson, up Lake George, up Lake Champlain, the Richelieu River, and eventually they get to uh, St. Francis Xavier Mission try and get the slide of the mission. Thank you. Back. <laughs> yes, I think it is. Building the chapel, yes. Oh, okay. At St. Francis Xavier Mission in Kahnawaga on the St. Lawrence River, Cattery meets three or four Jesuit missionaries, Father Cholnick and Father Claude Chachetier. And the mission is pretty successful. They've got cornfields, they've got warriors to hunt, and they've got enough people they have to build a new chapel. It was the custom of Jesuits who could draw. Obviously, uh, Father Chachetier is not a trained artist, but he could sketch. And he would draw pictures to illustrate the Bible stories that they would tell the Iroquois in the catechism classes. And he would do drawings of things that were going on at the mission. And so they, here we see one of his sketches of building a new chapel, St. Francis Xavier Chapel in Kahnawaga. And Cattery and the other Catholic women would sit by the cross and talk about different aspects of catechism, theology, stories of lives of the saints. And so this is supposed to be the Cattery and two other Catholic women sitting in the background there looking out over the St. Lawrence River. They were very, very devout. They spent all their time uh, praying, sharing stories of theology, and practicing severe penances. Remember before Vatican II, it was, it was a big thing to do a lot of severe penance and fasting. Now the Iroquois people were accustomed to fasting, so uh, when they turned Catholic, they thought, okay, it's the same thing. We'll just we're still fasting. They might um, fast for several days. They might say their rosary barefoot in the snow. They might say it standing in freezing cold water in the winter time. They practice. Uh, flagellation. Some people would borrow an iron girdle from the Jesuits and wear it on Fridays and uh, as a penance. And they went a little too far because the Jesuits didn't realize the Iroquois culture of uh, strength and bravery and physical extremes like torture. And so they, a lot of times they would do these things where the priest could not see them because they suspected the Jesuit fathers would not approve of their severe, severe penances. Now, St. Cattery lived up there at Kahnawaga and the fathers quickly realized that she was very advanced in her prayer life. She had a great devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and so she was allowed to make her first communion 
at Christmas in 1677 after she got there. They were not um, really encouraging of Indian converts making their first communion and receiving the sacraments too early in their spiritual life because they were very worried about backsliding. So this was uh, a big deal that Cattery was allowed to make her first communion so early. And she was also a member of the Society of the Holy Family, which was started in Montreal. And her adopted sister, Anastasia, was the, the head of the Society of the Holy Family. And this encouraged Indian men to model themselves on St. Joseph, the women to model themselves on the Blessed Mother, and the children to model themselves after young Jesus and be a good, obedient child. It was a big deal to be invited to join the Society of the Holy Family when you were living there at uh, St. Francis Xavier Mission. Now, Cattery would practice these extreme penances, she and her friends, and she would pray for hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament, even in the winter, and there's no heat in the chapel, and she would be, be there praising for hours, and Father Cholnek would take her to his house and get her to warm up, put her in front of the fire so that she wouldn't uh, uh, die of exposure. And they did try to moderate the Native Americans' penances, but they couldn't always tell when somebody was doing something. Now, we, we, I mentioned the corn, the bean, and the squash before. The primary food besides whatever meat they were hunting for. The main food a lot of time in the winter would be a, a corn meal pudding called sagamite. And Kevin, my husband, and I have made sagamite. Believe me, it's not very tasty. <laughs> Boiled ground corn, probably without salt. Cattery, as a penance, would mix ashes with her sagamite to make it taste even worse. Now, when the um, when someone was ill in a Mohawk village in the summer. They were in the longhouse on their mat with a, a bottle of water and a dish of sagamite because everybody else had to be out working in the fields. Cattery was known for taking care of the sick and anybody who was wounded in a fight instead of just leaving them there on their mat. It was also the custom in the winter time for the young people to go out on hunting parties in the snow leaving the elderly or the sick who couldn't manage the deep snow to stay in the village and there with the rest of the food. And hopefully the hunting party would be able to bring fresh meat back out to, uh, back to the town. St. Cattery went on one of these winter hunting parties, but she was very, very unhappy because she was not able to go to mass. And so she would make a cross in the woods someplace and pray in her little private spot. And uh, the next, second year she was there, she decided she did not want to go out with the hunting party for the winter. And she was getting pretty weak by this point because of her severe penances. She would pick thorn bushes and put them under her sleeping mat. That was another of her penances. And there's a, a great portrait, which unfortunately will not show up, uh, by a Mohawk artist who did the canoe drawing, K.R. Montour. He did the illustrations for one of the books on the reading list that I put in the back. On the back table by the icon, there's a little reading list if you want to read more about St. Cattery. And, um, Montour has this great portrait of her holding a branch of thorns with her blue blanket over her head. And unfortunately, that slide will not show up. So St. Cattery spent the winter of 1679-80 in the village because she was getting weaker and weaker. And it's, uh, she had been to Montreal across the river on a trading mission with some other women and saw 
sisters living in community in a convent. And she thought this was a wonderful idea. And she wanted to establish a community of Indian sisters there at Kahnawaga. And the Jesuits had several um, disagreements with that idea. They didn't have a big enough community to support the sisters. Everybody had to work to keep the, the village fed. And they were very worried about them being captured by the Iroquois if they raided Kahnawaga. But St. Cattery really wanted to establish the first community of Native American sisters. And in 1679, she was allowed to take a vow of perpetual virginity. By 1680, she was getting really quite weak, especially with severe penances during Lent. And what is our next picture? What have we got? Oh, could you go to the Cattery profile? Certainly. Thank you. This is another sketch by K.R. Montour. One of the, while Cattery was living in Kahnawaga, she decided that she would give up all ornaments except for her cross. And red blankets were very fashionable among the Iroquois girls. So somebody decide, said that, you know, that's too mean wearing a red blanket. So she switched to wearing a blue blanket. And she gave up all of her ornaments. The, uh, one of the trade items you'll hear about, you know, when you read your history book, the Native Americans bought trinkets. Well. They, they really weren't trinkets. They were wool cloth, metal tools, and beads, glass beads, and silver jewelry. So uh, I usually wear reproductions of those 17th and 18th century silver jewelry. I wear my Jesuit rings. I've got today, I wore my um, trade silver earrings. And St. Cattery gave up wearing all of that jewelry except for her cross and switched to wearing a blue blanket because she thought that was a lot less vain than a red blanket. Now, in Lent of 1780, she was getting very, very weak. She's sleeping on her mat of thorns. She's mixing ashes with her sagamite. And by Holy Week, she was getting in a very bad state. Could you go to the tomb picture, please? Absolutely. And she died in Holy Week of 1680. Her friends and the fathers who were there in her deathbed saw that after she died, her smallpox scars disappeared and she became glowingly lovely. And a couple of Frenchmen who heard that this girl had died, and they knew St. Cattery, but they went to look at the body, and they didn't even recognize her. And they said they would build a coffin for her. And after she was buried, this is obviously the modern tomb in St. Francis Xavier Church in Kahnawaga, but uh, after she died, numerous friends of hers had visions of her urging them to love Jesus and pray and practice their penances. And finally, her friend Anastasia had a vision where she heard Cattery saying, goodbye, I'm going to heaven now. And dirt from her grave would be uh, mixed with the primitive medicines of the time for people who were sick, and there were many miraculous cures after she died. About a year after Cattery died, Father Claude experienced a vision of her, and she asked him to paint her portrait. And the portrait, um, which we do unfortunately do not have a picture of, could you go to the um, other tomb picture? Thank you. 
the portrait Father Claude painted, he knew her. He painted her in her linen shirt, her blue blanket pulled over her head, and her blue wool kilt, leggings, and moccasins. And that is the portrait that I used as documentation for my icon, and I encouraged Christine to use when she was making our icon of St. Cattery for our wall of icons. That was also reproduced in a huge banner in St. Peter's Square at the canonization. Was it? Did anybody else go on the pilgrimage? Did, I, did you go on the pilgrimage? No? Okay. I fought a couple other people from the parish went on the pilgrimage. I know some people did, but they're not here today. But that was the image of St. Cattery that was reproduced at the canonization in St. Peter's Square. And Father Claude painted the portrait, and then he painted some small copies of it, and eventually a, a, an engraved holy card was made of St. Cattery in it holding the cross, looking at it adoringly, and that was the first 17th century holy card of her. Um, when the small copies of the portrait were distributed to the sick, they also were miraculously cured. Now, St. Cattery uh, was, she wasn't a saint yet, but she was prayed to and asked for favors from by various people over the years, including Native Americans, and different books were written about her, and then in the 1930s, the cause for her canonization really got going. She was declared venerable. She had a miracle, to be, two miracles for her to be declared blessed. And of course, she was canonized in 2012. And uh, this is her tomb today. You can go up to St. Francis Xavier Church in Kanawanda and see it. The candles in front of her tomb, this is like the 1950s tomb, um, they actually have the portrait on them from that uh, copies of the portrait that Father Claude painted of her. And I was always attracted to St. Cattery, partly because she's a local girl and partly because it's our local 17th century history. Uh, but I was thinking about it because of the questions that Dave gave us all the presenters to talk about. And I, I realized that probably part of the reason I identified with St. Cattery was because when I was a little girl, I was very, very shy. And of course, so I was terribly bullied in school. So uh, that might be part of the reason, but I've always uh, had a great uh, devotion to St. Cattery. And does anybody have any questions? Yeah. In the back? Yeah, um, I'm curious. I, I might have missed this. Um, the, the, penitent, the severe penitential practices of the Mohawks, or at least a segment of them, did that derive from their history, or did they kind of adopt the French it, it Catholic was, stuff, which was Jansenistic by that time? It was a combination of both. Okay. So if the Mohawk warriors are going out on the war path, they might take a little cornmeal to make sagamite in, in, on their belt, a little bag of it. But they might fast for several days. And uh, when there was plenty of food, the Iroquois people and other tribes would eat plenty. But they were used to going without if they needed to. And so, and they also, had the custom of practicing these terrible tortures on their captive enemies. So uh, it was a combination of both, and I don't think the, the Jesuits realized the uh, more severe aspects of Iroquois culture. And so when they're talking about penances, the Catholic converts carried it way to the extreme. And in fact, in um, the book, So in one of the books on the list, that reading list that I have in the back, um, I, the author is Emily something. She discusses that towards the end of the book because it, today 
in the 21st century, people find it really kind of horrifying. <laughs> so she goes into uh, the differences and what it meant in the 17th century as opposed to what we do today. And another question? Okay. Um, obviously, uh, every left what is the perception today among Native peoples about favorite? I mean, because that is kind of a mixed sort of... It is a mix. And another book on the list is Darren Bonaparte's uh, book about St. Cattery. And he addresses that in his book because he's a Mohawk author. So there are a lot of uh, people who, Native Americans and other people, who are very devoted to St. Cattery. And then there's a lot of people who think that she was taken over by the French as an image. And that a lot of this, uh, you know, her face being transformed after she died was like uh, sort of a, a whitening of her image, like Europeanizing of her image. And so you've got opinions all across the spectrum. But Darren Bonaparte does address that in his book. Yes? Uh, would she be considered a saint today? She well, a, she, she, today she is considered I a saint. I know, but I mean, if uh, what she did was done uh, by today, would she be considered a saint at all? Well, I don't know. I mean, I suppose it depends on which sort of like faction of the contemporary church you, you subscribe to. <laughs> um, does, I suppose Vatican II people, we're not into these severe penances. We're into helping others. But you get out wet in the West with uh, Midwest with the real conservative, conservative Catholics, they would probably yes. admire those severe penances, and they still like to wear something on their head when they go to mass. Well, I wasn't thinking necessarily of that. I was thinking of the example of Jesus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Had nothing to do with extreme uh, penance or anything like that. So, um, you know, this is a big part of her background, and yet I, I base most of what I do on Jesus, what he did. And he was not into any of that. And, you know, well, it's, it's a very, you know, it's, pre, it's a very Tridentine, pre Vatican II mindset when. People, you know, ate fish on Friday and practiced penances and fasted a lot and you couldn't have anything after midnight if you wanted to go to communion. And our whole attitude today is different. But up in, in the in the early 20th century, you know, uniting yourselves to the sufferings of Jesus was was the big theme, and that was what she was doing. Yes? Um, a postscript to um, her. Um, a friend of mine was a chaplain at um, Seattle Community, uh, Seattle Children's Hospital. Oh, did he know Jake? I'm sorry? Did he know the little boy Jake? So, no, Liv, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. You All finish right. your story. Anyway, um, while he was chaplain there, uh, an indigenous boy was admitted to the hospital because yes. he yes. Um, he had a, a fatal illness. Yes. And uh, he was the the boy's family was instructed to pray to uh, to the saint, and he was cured. Yes, he was. And, and that's just recently. That was that was five years ago, and six that, years ago. Exactly, and that was the final miracle. Right. That sealed St. Cattery's cause for canonization. Jake, I think the last name was Finkbonner, he was playing basketball at school and he ran into the, the post holding the basket and cut his lip. And unfortunately, he contracted flesh-eating bacteria, which is usually fatal. And so he was at that hospital, and the surgeons kept operating and operating and trying to get ahead of the flesh-eating bacteria. And they thought he was going to die. And a sister, a nun named Sister Cattery, came and with a relic and 
the family and the, it was a Native American family. Jake's family is Native American, and they all of their friends, everybody started praying to St. Cattery for Jake. And the doctors one day said in the meeting with the parents, I think it stopped. And he was cured. And when I was on the pilgrimage to Rome for the canonization, I was standing outside the St. Sebastian catacombs talking to another tourist, and I looked at the guy's name tag, and it was Jake's uncle. Oh, wow. It was very cool. Yes, Eileen. I'd like to put it into a little bit of what we're just discussing about St. Gattery and her, her spirituality. I'd like to put it in a little bit this, uh, of a bigger frame of devotional spirituality. Uh, that's not been my spirituality to have a devotion to the saints or practice or whatever. And when we were traveling in Ireland, we spent a day at the, the uh, Shrine of Back, which is supposedly a, a place where the uh, Virgin Mary had appeared. And I was thinking, oh, it's going to be a long day. And I, I found, I, found um, I, I, like, I walked through all the things that were the history of, the, of what happened at that. And that really grabbed me, that they had suffered terribly in the west of Ireland. In one, I forget which of the famines, but it was like people died, bodies piled on top of each other. It was just an awful time. And this apparition gave them such hope and comfort. And so I have the feeling that maybe when we take a look at somebody like Kateri, and perhaps any of the people who have devotions to saints, I think that the, the, the divine spirit of us all provides this kind of um, happening or whatever, however people come to understand it, that, the, the, that makes it a special miraculous event, whatever it is, uh, I think it's done perhaps for consolation for people who need it. You think about Catery's, uh, it's ongoing with Catery. It's ongoing at night with the Virgin Mary. I, that's my way of, of accepting it and understanding it. Well, I think that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? I, I was wondering what the word on her tomb is, the first word. Is. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. I can't read Mohawk, and I have no idea. It might be, it might be Lily of the Mohawks, but I'm sorry. I cannot tell you. Do, do you have any idea what that word is? Yeah. Do you read Mohawk? or? No, I don't. Oh, okay. I, only, I know a few words in Native. Yeah, the, I, I only know a few words myself, so. Uh -huh, uh -huh. No, I, I'm sorry. I'm sure if you go to the website and look it up, you can find out what it is, but I'm sorry. I cannot read Mohawk. Um, now, our, our lovely Philip Schuyler, he was pulling Mohawk, but I'm not. Yes, you were going to say. I was just going to ask a question. Uh, like going off of that, how much do you know about the Iroquois nation today? Well, you know, I'm a history buff, so yeah. until, I'm really good up until about 1800. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I'm a retired National Park Ranger. So, you know, I, my field of study is the 18th century, and I don't know a lot about the, the Iroquois nation today. I know that a lot of, um, after the American Revolution, most of the Six Nations of the Iroquois moved to Ontario because they had sided with the British during the American Revolution. The Oneidas had a Protestant missionary they really liked, and so the Oneidas fought on the American side in the Revolution and stayed there. But uh, the Mohawks and the Senecas and some of the other tribes moved to Ontario, like Chief Joseph Grant. He had to leave the Mohawk Valley. Uh, out by Buffalo, there are a lot of uh, reservations. And the Mohawk are known today as great iron workers on high buildings. In fact, K.R. Montour, who uh, did the illustrations for Darren Bonaparte's book. He grew up in New York City in an iron worker family. And he's a commercial artist because he went to the High School of Music and Art in New York City, and then he went to art school in New York City and he became a commercial artist. So, uh, I don't know as much probably about the Iroquois today 
as I'd like to. Yes? Um, from about uh, 1999 to 2000, I went to Seneca Nation with my mother. Oh, how nice. Yeah, and um, I got to meet Maureen Red Eye and Chief Red Eye there. And mm -hmm. my experiences were really neat. I mean, I, that's, it's probably a bit more spiritual. And I got to take her a drive around the whole village with, with Maureen. Mm -hmm. And uh, she taught us a lot while we were there about the whole res. And one of the things that she taught me, because I, I had bought a book on corn planter. I don't oh, know yeah. anybody to yeah. familiar with them. And she said, you need to read the book three times, she said. Because on three different occasions, George Washington could have killed corn planter. And she said, if you remember to read it three times, you'll find out that I'm telling you the truth in the book. But she also taught me when I first got there, um, she introduced me to a 16-year-old boy. And the reason why I asked you if you knew anything about the Iroquoian uh, nation today, the Iroquoian nation is actually only about that big on the map up by where I live in uh, Wananta, the city of the hill. Uh -huh. And it used to be as large as the whole entire, the 16-year-old boy told me this, as large as the entire area coming from the east coast to the west coast all along the top part of uh, the northern part of the country. I guess I just wanted to talk a little bit about where where I came from, you know, where well, I come you. from. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Let me share. And you're welcome. Yeah. You. Anybody you. else have a question? Well, it's about twenty of it. I know Father has to go upstairs and get ready for mass. <laughs> I don't know if they're going to start without me. <laughs> <laughs>